How you doing, Gabe? Doing well, Greg. Thanks for asking. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We read today an article by Jonathan Anderson, Conceptual Art, Theology, and Representation. Um, I think this was published in 2022 by Religions. Apparently, that's that's a journal. All of them. Religions. They all got all together them. and just... Yeah, it's literally just called Religions. Yeah. All right. By MDPI. What does MDPI stand for? I see I'm a bad academic. MDPI's journal called Religions. Um, I mean, on, on the... I'm, I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, why did I have you read... Like, this is probably the heaviest art theory we've read. Well, maybe except for Benjamin. Maybe, but it's in the same vein as Benjamin, where it's it's a pretty academic, you know, art art critique, art historian take on the art world yeah. and trying to figure out like, okay, what are all these artists doing? What are these groups of artists saying? How do I link these groups of artists together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you like what did you get as as Jonathan's overall art like argument? What is he talking about here? Yeah, overall it seems to almost be a a, a I don't know if a defense is the right word, but an explanation of how conceptual art and some of the very modern and postmodern art that's being made today is still addressing and tackling complicated religious and Christian religious issues, mm-hmm. um, albeit in a really different way than the paintings of crucifixions and traditional altarpieces and church architecture that sure. we might be used to seeing. Sure, yeah. And is that like, do you take, is Jonathan saying Christianity is still there, but it's a husk of what it was and like it's shambling around and it will finally be dead? Or is there, is it like, or is there something else that he's getting at? Uh, he's definitely getting at something else. He's not, he's not necessarily, you know, it's all, it's all already gone to hell and this mm-hmm. is what's left of it. Um, I think he's making the point that with, with the ideas of conceptual art and what he calls representation, you can say new things and you can make new takes. Like there are, mm. there are new ways at getting at old information through these mediums. Yeah, interesting. But he, he also doesn't necessarily say, he doesn't go as far as Ben Hameen would go to say that because of these new conceptual art forms or representation that the old art forms are useless or that this has in some way kind of completely replaced or overtaken or requires a new a new religion or a new spirituality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the beginning of his abstract starts with this idea, within the vast and varied scholarship of contemporary art, the relations between conceptual art and religion generally have not received careful investigation. And, like, that's just true. It is. Like, I, if you look at his citations, he's he's not... All of his ideas about what conceptual art is about and, and how it relates to religion, he's the one that's writing this the first time. He is. And <laughs> I, to, to, I was recently at a gathering with a group of really, really smart people, um, people who are all actually in Hillsdale's um, classics program, their mm-hmm. master's classics program. So these are people who spend the, all of their time thinking about religion and art and literature all these things and at some point during this conversation one of the people um at at this this dinner i was at said essentially that they don't think any christian art has been made in the last 150 years which is something that i profoundly disagree with but it's the general take of the academic world especially the i guess you could say more traditional christian academic world Mm -hmm. that um, at some point, Christian art died, mm-hmm. and we haven't had anything good come out of right. the art world right. in the last long, long time. Right. Well, what we've done in this series of discussions, which this is going to be our last one, mm-hmm. um, is kind of glossed. And, and I mean, we've, we've continually been coming back to Wendell Berry's essay, and we've been kind of looking at the higher level ideas of almost all of these. Mm-hmm. I kind of want to do something a bit different with this. Because, well, it's a relatively short essay. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a section where he kind of goes through what is conceptual art. And he says that looking at conceptual art, we can see six logics that conceptual artists employ. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of briefly shows how, hey, those logics are actually an 
adhere with many of the tenets of many religions, not just Christianity. He talks about Islam, Buddhism, and Christianity, mm -hmm. and how all of those religions imply, apply those logics within their own religious practices, because um, he's not just focused on Christian, Christianity. But then he takes a deep dive into Chris Martin, a Belgian artist um, who does work almost exclusively with Christian imagery in really weird postmodern, I would, I would call it uh, contemporary art practices, um, mainly because postmodernism is a weird philosophical term that mm -hmm. personally I think we've moved beyond in the world of art. Um, but so I want to go through that because there's some really interesting things that I think can help us and hopefully whoever listens to us um, think through what on earth conceptual art is getting at and like what happened 150 years ago mm -hmm. that started this kind of train that has drastically changed the way we look at art. And for a lot of people, they respond, like this whole dialogue series has been, we've been kind of uh, wrestling with the reality that the visual arts have lost a huge majority of their audience and have alienated themselves and there's all kinds of reasons why. Right, this and kind of breakdown of trust between artist and audience and audience and artist, where right. artists don't trust their audiences and audiences don't trust the artists. Right, and on the one hand, you can see a model of repairing that mm -hmm. would be like trying to go back in time. And there, um, I think in our conversations we've discussed this, but if not on some of my other video essays, there are artists around today, there are whole galleries and museums dedicated to the far more, uh, you know, what, what most people would call the traditional manners of artistic um, production, whether that's, uh, you know, oil painting like the masters or, uh, you know, writing, writing sonnets, you know, that exists still. Mm -hmm. And so one of, the, one of the things I would say, like one of the strategies is you're an artist, you care about people today Mm -hmm. Everyone's saying visual art is bogus and it's a bunch of, you know, <laughs> snake oil. It's like, well, one thing you could do is go learn how to paint like the masters. And then you could give those people paintings that they like. You're probably not going to do that. No, no. But I still, I think it's a, a valid strategy. I even have classmates, one in particular comes to mind, and her entire practice right now is focused around, like, learning traditional kind of master level oil painting techniques, like skin rendering and then using those techniques to kind of say more more modern things or using those things to using those traditional art forms like there are yeah. people in every art program who are doing that still right well and this is one of the things that frequently those who are on the conservative side ask a question of something like picasso is the great example right picasso's early paintings are uh, pretty decent i'm actually blown away by how frequently the unart initiated or like he was a brilliant painter no he was a fine painter <laughs> he could do academic figurative painting that looked like people um and then they're like well and he was choosing to break the rules so you have to learn the rules in order to break them which maybe um but either way it's like there's some respect in that but still there will be these questions one of my video video essays addresses this so basically if you can paint well why would you paint like this crap? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what's happening. Right. And I think that not only have religious folk and, and people who are more conservative and traditional misunderstood it, but it has largely misrepresented itself. And I would always point, my main boogeyman is Clement Greenberg. I think Greenberg drastically derails us. But so I wanna go through kind of point by point, and because I've got a series of questions tied to the quotes, and uh, I think it'll be relatively quick for us. Yeah. And, and we'll see what happens. All right. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, right near the beginning, he's quoting Solowit. Um, do you know the work of Solowit very well? Yeah, I uh, do actually, yeah. I was going to say, he, he is kind of like considered the godfather of the conceptual artist. For folks who don't know him, frequently his artwork is just a series of instructions. Mm -hmm. And it'll be something like uh, randomly place 80 points on a wall and then draw lines directly connecting every single point with the other 79 points. Right. And his work of art is those instructions. Right. When you buy a solo wit, you buy the instructions, and then you're allowed to do that project and call it a solo wit whenever. Yeah. So it's, it's highly conceptual. And that's just to, as in, as in uh, he is saying the work of art is the concept. So 
um, Jonathan quotes from uh, Lewitt's 1967 paragraphs on conceptual art. And so Lewitt says, all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. In this context, when you're thinking about Lewitt, what does conceptual art mean? So for me personally, when I, when I think about Solo, I, I tend to think that what he was really doing is pointing out something we've already talked a lot about, which is art as a process and the medium of art or the important part of art being a process. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to distill this process down and in some ways make it like highly accessible. Like he's, he's taken it and made it to a point where anybody actually, regardless of training, can make a solo wit piece. Like they're, they're really easy to make. The, the instructions don't require any level of um, like technical mastery. Mm -hmm. So what he's, what he's doing is two, two parts where he's first of all saying, um, like stop spending so much time looking at the actual thing and think about what it's trying to say to you, think about that concept. And also then bringing it back to the process and saying, um, well, I think it's, it's in that quote. He says, all the decisions have been, been made beforehand. The execution doesn't matter. Um, well, specifically, he says uh, the execution is perfunctory right. affair, but also that the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Right. Sorry. So not that the execution doesn't matter, but that there's this this underlying thing behind the execution. That the Yeah, you could think of it more like it's not that it doesn't matter, it's that it's not necessary for the art. Mm -hmm. That the that the it's necessary for the experience of the art. Right. You could say something like that. Yeah. Um, maybe not even that. Like Lewitt might be fine with you just imagining reading the instructions and imagining what that could look like. Right. And in fact, he might be, he might say, he might enjoy that more than any of the manifestations. But I just want to like point out here. So the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Um, so often, like, well, and even before that, the planning and decisions are made beforehand. Like we looked at Rembrandt's uh, Prodigal Son. Mm -hmm. Why, like what, is, is a good way to think about what Rembrandt does as an artist, couldn't you say that Rembrandt, the reason we know Rembrandt is, we'll say, the author, the, the, you know, he has the authority over the piece, is because Rembrandt did all the planning and he did all the decision making and he was the thing, the machine, so to speak, that's Lewitt's talking about, that made the art, mm -hmm. right? Like, isn't that, that's why it's a Rembrandt? Yes, uh, we're getting, Interestingly enough, this, this, this part of the essay, I felt like it tied most closely into the idea of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, right? Mm -hmm. Because what essentially Saul Lewitt is saying is that he's making a really interesting point because he is the author and he's allowing his work, he's like encouraging his work to be infinitely produced in some way that is a little bit like has that same kind of feel of mechanical reproduction, right? Yeah. Like he's using people as his machine, right? But that person's just following a set of instructions in the same way that a, you know, a computer or some sort of a, a line drawing robot could do. Yeah. He's, he's well, and you can see really quickly there, like what I said about Rembrandt is mm -hmm. Rembrandt was the machine who made his work. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Michelangelo then. Right. Who's older than Rembrandt. Did Michelangelo make all of his work? No, he had, I mean, I think, I forget, I forget the exact number, but lots and lots and lots of apprentices who were like churning out these, these right. masterfully planned pieces that he made. Right, right, masterfully planned. So Michelangelo planned it mm -hmm. and he made all the decisions, especially right. with the Sistine Chapel. He's the one who tore it down twice yeah. before it was like finished. All of those little machines that he had who were making it and then being like, nope, we gotta start over. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the ones who suffer. Because of, I mean, of this jerk. <laughs> to, to, be, to be fair, I know he was, um, there's some great Michelangelo poetry about how much he hates being on his back up yeah. in the scaffolding. So he was, he was yeah. there too, but he yeah, definitely... He, he, it, it completely changed his spine for yeah. the rest of his life. Great book on Michelangelo called The Agony and the Ecstasy, which is getting at how much, how much in order to have that ecstasy, how you have to have almost an equal, if not more, amount mm -hmm. of agony. Yeah. Um, which is 
yeah, interesting. It's an interesting book. Um, Irwin, Irwin or Irving, I think wrote it. I forget. Um, but so you can see, like, for a long time, we've we've known like. Most of us would say the way we know that a Gabe Kimball work of art is a Gabe Kimball work of art is because Gabe Kimball made it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I was supposed to say your whole name there. Yeah, well, it's right. happened before. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've, you've, you were the one who said Kimball before. But, yeah. um, you know, like, a, and we've been like, well, we know because it came from your hand. Mm-hmm. And starting way back with the Renaissance, artists are starting to realize, well, there's kind of something more important about auth- authorship and if Michelangelo didn't have that whole horde of assistants, we wouldn't have the Michelangelos. Right. So is it as important that it's Michelangelo's hand or that Michelangelo's in charge? And so you can see just further and further ramifications of that one principle. It's the Sistine Chapel is still a Michelangelo. Right. Doesn't matter that his hand maybe didn't touch all of it. Yeah. And this also allows us to, you know, touch up paintings. It allows us to, there's all kinds of philosophical arguments about this. There's one that goes back to Socrates, I think, about a boat and about a boat sailing. And if on its journey, you bring all of the parts necessary to completely remake the boat. Mm -hmm. If the boat is sailing and in the course of its journey, you you have replaced all of the boat one piece at a time. Is it the same boat? Right. And we don't have a truth bearing answer to that but effectively everyone's like yeah it's the same boat Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's the same or i've I've even heard people um i I think it's interesting that same principle i think often gets applied to the human body right where it's like oh over the course of your life every almost every part of your body will be you know permanently changed like you're not Every, it's every, like every 14 years. Yeah, you, you, there's no, every trace of the organic material that was you has been kind of cast off. Which imagine the ramifications if we didn't jump to this conceptual level of mm-hmm. a human being. Like, if every 14 years you're a new person, you can commit a crime, and 14 years later you're not that same person who committed that crime. Right. Why are you in prison? Yeah. Like, we wouldn't be able to say... No, the whatever is you mm-hmm. is more than just the skin and bones. Yeah. And so it's like Lewitt is pointing out that as art history has expanded, we have come to a place where we've realized the work of art is, is something beyond just the idea that a, an artist made it with their own hand, which is, you know, you can go real existential and be like, how come we say Solowitz's hand is his hand? How do we right. know it's his hand and not someone else's? Exactly. But it's, <laughs> it's that same idea, though, that's allowed for so many, so many other ideas, like Andy Warhol's idea of um, replicating things mechanically and, like, allowing the process of, like, like he does these silkscreen prints, as we've already talked about, where more and more of the image is, like, degraded over time. And it's like that's yeah. the same principle being applied there, where it's like, oh, it's still Andy Warhol, even though he's using some sort of a process that he's not in control in. Like, that's well, important. Right, well, and this gets at, in the first the first years of photography, it was a question of, is this art? Mm-hmm. Because, like, well, there's no one drawing. Yeah. You know, like, literally, photograph means light drawing. Yeah. Like, the light is doing the drawing. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, man. That, you know, and this is where, this is, like, I always go back. There's tons of things that were happening, but the invention of the camera drastically does this. This is why Benjamin talks about art, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He's talking primarily about the, the camera right. because it completely changes our understanding of what is the, you could, you could call it the primary responsibility in the Wendell Berry sense. Mm-hmm. What is the primary responsibility of an artist in order to say, this is my art? And if you use history as an example, and if you look at not just things like cameras and photography, but yeah. even the the um, the models of the the workshop model, the apprenticeship model of the Renaissance age, there's something that doesn't necessi- necessarily require the artist to be the one physically doing the making. Yeah, and you keep going forward and forward, and then you you know in the nineteen um, like this this. Uh, 1967 is when LeWitt was writing this, and that's when he was highly active. So you come to the 1960s, and you get this artist being like, no, 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 no. Like, what's more important is the concept. Mm -hmm. I've done the artwork. I've done the planning and the decisions beforehand. And my art is that. It's Mm -hmm. the planning and decisions. 
and then it gets manifested. Right. And and even for him, you know, the question of does it need to be manifested, he's still an artist regardless. Yeah. As long as he has documentation that he wrote down those instructions, he's made a work of art. Right. And I think I think he I mean, a good deal of the point of his artwork was that he liked that question and he leaves it pretty ambiguous. Like the yeah. question of whether or not the final product are these wall drawings or the instructions or just the idea and even the instructions don't matter is, is his point more right. than anything. He, Which is why like th this is going, this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but this is why I've had my stance on AI generated images, which I hate that it's called AI. It's <laughs> algorithmically generated imagery. Um, the reason I have that stance is it's a further manifestation. Mm -hmm. It pushes beyond and it says, um, you know, it's going to a place that furthers conceptual art and is asking another question of, um, okay, what if the artist isn't making the decisions? Right. Like, does that matter? Like what if what if the artist is just laying out the original plan, mm -hmm. and that's where like you might not like that, but my guess is based on the churning of philosophical inquiry in art history, we will soon discover that actually all of the planning was made by the the artist, and the decisions, and the execution is perfunctory, not putting the decisions beforehand. Right, and I, I think it's important to say that isn't that isn't to say. Every every kind of further level of can, every further level of like removal from that process, I think it definitely makes things more complicated, and it calls into question like how do you do that responsibly to bring it back to Wendell sure. Berry. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I I tend to agree with you, and even to some extent, there's a the legal precedent that's been set kind of at the go has has defended that idea that like oh if you've made an ai generated image you at least have some right to use it as if it were your own like that gets complicated in a lot of places but yeah. if i make something using ai most most current image generation companies would say you're allowed to put that on a t-shirt and sell right, it right uh, this is like really going far afield but i want to point out like if if we're using you know in the sense of um why we know that the physical isn't as important with law. You know, 14 years, I'm a new body, why aren't I let out of jail? Mm -hmm. We can also go and say, well, um, uh, oh, who's, the, who's the guy who was the serial killer? Is it Jeffrey Dahmer who had, who's in California and they murdered the, the celebrities? The celebrities, are talking about the Manson family? Manson, Charlie, yeah. Charles Manson, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so Charles Manson, did the planning, mm -hmm. he did not do the decisions. Right. And he did not do the perfunctory murdering. Yeah. Yet he's the one in prison. Yeah. I mean, they're all in prison. Well, one of them just got released, but they're all in prison. Right. But it's like, there's some weight bearing on planning. No, And that's yeah. why I'm like, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm not surprised that this is going to be wholeheartedly eventually embraced because we've already done it with people. Mm -hmm. We've already said through our laws that planning is enough to inculcate you in a crime. Right. Therefore, it will be enough to say you're an artist. Right. I think that that's something that we've, we've like established time and time again is that I think the, the person at the top bears the most responsibility. Mm -hmm. If, a, if like a, a company is acting illegally, like oftentimes, like the, a lot of the employees will end up going, not having to, to pay for the mistakes of the CEO or the company or the board. Right. Like that yeah. happens fairly frequently. Yeah, it's bizarre. But anyways, back to this. So John, Jonathan is mentioning Saul LeWitt, I think rightfully so, because as the godfather of conceptual art, he's the one who is kind of really pointing out the most rigorously, like the physical thing isn't, isn't the important part. Mm -hmm. But... Jonathan, in his second paragraph, of course, brings up Duchamp right. um, and the ready maze. And he says, uh, Jonathan writes, conceptual art centered on the notion or realization that f uh, conceptual art is centered, uh, I'm reading it out of order here, but uh, that fundamentally art has less to do with the qualities of discrete objects than with particular modes of presentation supported by particular kinds of social interactivity. Like, that sounds like a bunch of academic jargon. And it it's, is. It's almost like he's a good <laughs> academic, unlike me. Um, <laughs> what, is, what are you getting out of that? 
Oh man, I'm gonna have to. I'll say, do you want me to interpret you, you, it one more yeah, time? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just interpret it. He's, so fundamentally, art has less to do with discrete objects. It's not the physical thing in front right. of you. Yeah. That that does. So fundamentally, it has less to do. So Jonathan's not saying it has nothing to do with it, mm -hmm. but the physical object is not nearly as important. The Rembrandt painting isn't the important thing necessarily. There might be something else, and specifically. He's getting at particular modes of presentation, so the way it presents something to you, and supported by kinds of social interactivity. Not only how it's presented to you, but how you interact with it. Right. So like you can see, oh, that's far more conceptual. It's in the realm of ideas. You know, like there's a table, like here, here's a urinal, but I'm presenting it to you on its side, mm -hmm. on a pedestal in a museum. And I've called it a fountain. And I've called it a fountain. <laughs> yes. That's all how it's presented. And then it's in the context of a particular social situation. What do we do in museums? That's where it places you. Mm -hmm. So the artist hasn't made anything, but what they have done, Duchamp, has set up a situation where now we're being presented with an object in a confusing manner that we're not used to and in a situation where we encounter specific types of things. Right. So, so for me, I remember this section now. So for me, this is the, the section that I thought, um, well, I'll say my experience of reading this essay was like a series of callbacks, which, which does it, which of our past readings is this section remind me of most? And yeah. for a lot of it, it did come back down to that either Benjamin or the, the Wendell Berry essay. But this is, this is the section where I was like, oh, what he's talking about here are reminders. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the important concept to kind of take away from this is that the physical object acts as um, an activator in some ways for us to be reminded of something else. Yeah. And, and then from there, that kind of got very um, Neumann Jung-esque where that's what he calls symbols, right? Symbols are activators of consciousness. That's yeah. like what these physical objects do is they, they're, they're able to fascinate our human brain enough that they make us think about things in a conceptual manner. Which goes back to Walker Percy's Delta Factor. Right. Of like, it's not a signification of an event that's happening, it's a symbolic, like we are symbol mongerers. Yeah. And like what these conceptual artists are doing is saying, the work of art is not primarily about a physical object, it's about how it becomes symbolic. Mm -hmm. That's the important part. It, and that's where Benjamin is confused. I mean, he's pre all of this. Yeah. You know, but he's, He's confused in the sense of when he says that mechanical reproduction reduces the aura of the object, he thinks that the aura is tied to the discreteness of its particular location. Mm -hmm. And what the conceptual artists reveal is, no, it's our relationship to the idea that matters. Right. It's, yeah. it's like as if to say, so um, uh, Percy, Percy talks about those triangles all the time and those, those kind of those lines. And it's like what conceptual art is focusing on is one of the legs of that triangle, specifically the leg of the triangle that connects um, the, the, the physical idea of the object to the idea that water is water everywhere, not just the water in my hand, or water is all of these things. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like not, it's, it's kind of honing in, not focusing on the entire triangle, not focusing on any of the points, it's just looking at that one leg, that one branch in between the two. Or it's maybe not just looking at that. It's saying that is the most um, important leg. Sorry, so yeah, speak. not yeah, maybe yeah. maybe it's not. It's not saying that the other the other three points and two legs don't yeah. exist, but it is it is focusing on that one. Well, you can see different artists kind of playing with this more because Lilwit still does want his physical manifestations, mm -hmm. but what he's saying is that that's not the primary interesting part. Right. And you'll see other artists, like uh, we've talked a little bit about the banana, um, that's uh, Catalan. You know, he also sold a six foot by six foot invisible sculpture made of nothing. Uh, and then he got sued by another artist who already did that. Um, so, but you can see like that's like, they're trying to be like, no, we don't even need that thing. Yeah. All we need is the idea. Right. Um, so like artists are playing with this and there's questions as to like, what's the most important, what's the most valid. But it's still actually like the contemporary art world has been convinced by Lewitt that the concept is most. I mean, you're a student of the arts. How often are we that interested in your craft and your skill versus like you're a senior now. Mm -hmm. 
Are we asking you to develop your skills or are we asking you to develop your concepts? Right. At this point, it's almost an entirely com concepts, which I think has came as um, almost a shock for almost our entire class where it's like we're at the point where we're turning out things that skill wise are the most visually interesting or like skillfully done. And all of a sudden we're getting negative feedback on things that were like, I really like the way this looks. And people are going, all right, all right. Yes, it looks cool. I'm not interested in it though. Like mm -hmm. that's the feedback that we're getting, which is, um, it is, it's a conceptual issue. Like, yeah, yeah, very weird. Um, good, <laughs> but um, good for us to hear, <laughs> but yeah. weird to be sure. Which this comes down, I'm, I'm so glad that Joseph Kosuth is our next quote. Um, did, did in this in this dialogue have we looked at his Co Kosu's three chairs? Yes, it's yeah. in a, a picture of a, of a is in two two videos ago or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Go Kosu is the, I mean he's seeing this. He's right. trying to show you all three legs of the triangle. Right. Yeah. Of like the word said chair, the physical object that the thing signifies. And then the idea, the image, the image of, of the chair. chair. Right. So he's trying to show you all three legs of that triangle, it's which a, is why we had to read Delta Factor. It's a great piece. It's such yeah. a, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's also, well, it's interesting you say great. It's, it's incredibly meaningful, but no one is going to like uh, hang that on the <laughs> no wall. No one would put it anywhere, but I think it's like, it's, right. um, it falls into the category of, I would say, important artwork. Like, it's, like, so important to know, to understand it. And also, like, I, I like talking about it way more than I like looking at it. Yeah, and this is, like, so Jonathan quotes Joseph Kosuth, 1969. Kosuth argued, this means that art's art condition is a conceptual state, or rather a conceptual, a conceptual event or activity. This is like the groundbreaking thing. When I, when I say, like, my, my argument would be over this whole dialogue would be slightly different than Jonathan's, but it's basically saying um, every single movement in art history is revealing more and more about the fundamental nature of what art is. Mm -hmm. So very ancient traditions, almost all of the art relates to religious objects. Right. And it's like, this is the way in which we see what is transcendent. Mm -hmm. And it's like then that, you know, transitions into royalty and the city state. It's serving that highest purpose that human beings of whatever particular culture have, whether that's their god, their king, or their nation. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see from face paint, tribal-based face paint, all the way up to temples made on the Acropolis. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's art is serving these highest things. And slowly as democracy is on the rise, we start wondering, well, the individual is the highest thing. Mm -hmm. So we start seeing, you know, a, a, a peasant can become a saint. You know, they're still in religious context, but it's like every single step along the way, it's stripping away some of the layers to try to get at what's at the core of what art is. And where conceptual art is landing is realizing that art is, is mostly... It's a deeper layer of art is not how it looks and, and the skill which is made, mm -hmm. but it's this condition of a concept. And that's where it's most fundamentally interesting, especially in the sense of uh, like, like uh, you can, wa well, it's, it's my argument against um, Quentin Tarantino movies. Like mm. they are visually stunning. They're yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like what you're saying with your seniors, your senior classmates. Like, you're making a beautiful painting. I've seen a lot of beautiful paintings. Right. I've watched a lot of movies that have tight editing, good acting, great writing. Mm -hmm. But by the time I'm on The Hateful Eight, and then I'm on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I'm like, I get your shtick, yeah. Tarantino. There's no meaning here. Mm -hmm. All it is is style and... and uh, and craftsmanship and there's no deeper concept the concept is you know for hateful eight it's like uh really really bad people stuck in a building together trying to like and on top of that is uh, yeah i mean there's no, no concept there no, there's there's really <laughs> and i think that that's that's something that i think um a lot of the directors today who are considered great tend to have mastered a style, like tend to have like something that is like stylistically bold and they can they can execute it, you know, almost perfectly every single time. The other director who comes to mind, um, 
and this isn't to say I don't I don't enjoy stylistically their work, but Wes Anderson is like a director who's yeah. like the epitome of it's all style, and it's a great style. He, well, and it didn't start off as all style. No, his early films, and this is the same with Tarantino. Reservoir Dogs is a wonderful movie, mm-hmm. and it is about something, right? Is it has a concept, but. Both of those directors slowly lose their concept. Asteroid City is actually about the fact that art has lost its conceptual value. Right. Like that that's what that movie's about, and that's why I I, I don't like the movie. It's it has this one scene at the end where you're like, that's the meaning right there. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's just Wes Anderson doing Wes Anderson things. Yeah. Which is real straight on. We, we I think we could oh well, this is this is a non a non sequitur to sequitur for sure, but like there are, there are some Wes Anderson movies, especially the Wes Anderson movies where he's adapting something, adapting mm-hmm. another book or adapting something. I think his book a- adaptations are truly great because they yeah. always have a point and they have a great story. And it's like if he's able to apply that style to something with meaning, yeah. you get something like, um, uh, what's it? Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is a which is a really fun movie, and it's got like a lot of like heart and soul, for lack of a better term, because it's adapted off of a, a well written children's book. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Hmm. There's a lot. To, George Saunders has more to say about why Saunders and Dillard have more to say about why that why writing has maintained more conceptual depth than especially film. But a lot of it has to do with what we've talked about in the sense of attention. The fact that it's easy to give, it's easy for a film to get your attention, whereas a book, like, it's very easy for you to lose your attention in a yeah. book. And so this is why it's, it, you, you have to actively try to read James Joyce's Ulysses. Mm-hmm. Whereas most books, they understand that, like, the way Saunders would put it is that the primary job of the author is to get the person to read the next sentence. Mm-hmm. And it's like, now you can see why he, he, that is fundamentally audience focused. Right. Whereas the arts, the visual arts in particular, have gone away from that. And the film arts have gone into, like, as in cinema, has gone largely more towards spectacle, as in, well, all we need to do is get their attention. Right. And that's the Marvel films. Yeah. Uh, but so, so from here, Jonathan goes to, uh, he goes back, he's kind of talking about Kosuth, talking about LeWitt, combining it with Duchamp, and he says, the ready-made thus displaced methods of, rep- of representation with strategies of representation, such that even representational images, especially photographs, but also already existing paintings, sculptures, and other artifacts, are often represented as things that function within and thereby reveal larger sociocultural patterns of life. So you already mentioned this whole thing that he's saying here. What is, what is he getting at at representation? Right, so, so all of a sudden he's, he's talking about this idea of these, the, this kind of brand of, of conceptual artists where all of a sudden they, they were almost taking their, their hand out of it even more, like in, in a strange way. And they're just kind of taking things and like directing people's attention, just saying, all right, look at this in this context now and try and try and kind of see what I'm seeing about it in this context. Like, Yeah, you can see this. The camera, the photograph is a really good example of right. like, um, if you're painting still lifes because you're a good Dutch master mm-hmm. and the point of the still life is to show how bountiful your culture is, but then also... So it's, it's a little bit of bragging, mm-hmm. which is like what most of those paintings are doing. Like yeah. they've got, first of all, go look at the old watermelons. Like we have way better watermelons than them because <laughs> uh, we've got, you know, GMOs. Um, but we've got these, you know, beautiful watermelons. Their watermelons have these weird spots in them and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but so you're in the middle of the Netherlands in the middle of winter and you've got access to watermelons. Mm-hmm. Like talk about age of empires and the age of the imperialization. Right. You know, they're flexing on that. Look at all the bounty we have. But then also there's the harsh reality of like death is always everywhere and people are getting syphilis. Oh my God. Like all of the founding, not all of them, but many of them had syphilis. It's like horrible. But they're like dying of these diseases. And so oftentimes you don't want to just brag. Mm-hmm. There's some humility, and so there's always a memento mori. There's a flower dying. There's a rotted orange. There's mm-hmm. something in those paintings. But then the camera comes along, and it's like, well, why spend all that time 
painting that thing. Mm-hmm. If the idea is to just, so I can take a photo of the still life. Right. And then like you start going even further, it's like, well, why don't I just present you with a watermelon? Like, why do I need to even take a photo of the watermelon? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, fundamentally what I'm doing when I'm painting, we call it representation, but really what I'm trying to do is present you with a set of ideas. Mm-hmm. Look at our bounty and don't forget that you're gonna die. Mm-hmm. Enjoy this while it lasts, but also remember you're gonna die. Yeah. It's like, well, wait, I can do that without making those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't actually need to make those things. There right. might be value in it. Mm-hmm. And this gets at the, the uh, sort of the next thing about this, which is um, what this leads to is an interpretation of art that asks the question, what does it mean to do this? Which if you know me and my critiques, what's the first question? Always, what are we looking at? Exactly. Once we know what we're looking at, we can ask the next question, which is something along the lines. Usually I say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, you know that I'm at my core, I'm a performance artist. And so (laughs) what I'm really trying to get at is, what does it mean for this person who made this thing to, to make it, to mm-hmm. do it. Why did they make this? Yeah. What are we receiving from that? And that is all conceptual meaning-based. Mm-hmm. We're looking at it, we're not saying, you know, it's like I know why someone sits down and learns how to paint. They want to be good at painting. Mm-hmm. Fine. That's, uh, that's great. That, yeah. Yeah, right, that's fine, do that, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's like, I don't care. Yeah. But it's like if you sit down and you do something really bizarre and I'm sitting there wondering like, you know, what? Why did you do that? What does that mean? Now it's like I'm breaking out of my patterns of thought. I'm, I'm trying to discover something new. And I'm especially, you know, I'm thinking about like one of your peers is making, uh, had a project where they're making pottery with like all kinds of weird utensils. Yes. It's like, why? Like, I know you can make a pot, so why would you do this? Yeah. And it's like, that's all the questions I was asking her during critique. It's mm-hmm. like, why would you do this? What is that getting at? And what does that reveal to me about the process of make, of throwing a pot, throwing yeah. a vessel. Um, it's it's like all of this is getting at the the conceptual artists are making an uh, I think an extremely compelling argument that the most important thing about most artwork is not what is being represented represented what is being represented to us. Mm-hmm. You know why would we make urinals and why would we you know, why would an artist turn it on its side? Mm-hmm. And what exactly is he getting at when he places the urinal in the gallery? Yeah. What is he saying about the gallery? And what is he saying about me going there to see it? Right. It's, a, it's such a, this is a little bit of a, I, I promise this relates. <laughs> they're, they're doing demolition on, on one of the dorms. And they, they recently ripped out uh, this, this old bathroom in the basement of one of the dorms. And one of the things they pulled out of there was an old urinal. There's this, then there was this old urinal that was like sitting outside of a dumpster for some reason. Like it was propped up against the dumpster because whoever was carrying it didn't feel like tossing it over the wall. And one of the art students in my class saw it and took a picture of it and was like, "Guys, we need to get this." And instantly, everybody in the class like was like, "We banded together and we're like, yeah, we're gonna get this urinal all the way across campus, get it." And it's just been sitting in the basement of our building, but everybody's like so fixated on having the urinal down there, even though it just sits on its side in the middle of the floor. And it's like that sort of thing where it's like, to us, I was like, wondering what the store was talking <laughs> about. The urinal that's down there? Yeah, yeah totally. So, but it's, it's because of this exact thing that we're talking about, where it's yeah. like, oh, we, first of all, we all know the story of Duchamp and his urinal and the fountain. Mm-hmm. And second of all, we thought it was so funny that there was like a urinal just sitting outside mm-hmm. and like 10 people at the same time decided that like, something we want in our building is this idea, this representation yeah. of the urinal and conceptual art and sculpture. And we don't care what happens with it. Like anybody knows that anybody could like break it or do anything, but we're just like, for now, let's just have it around because wow. that's, that's good for us. That has my mind going so many different places. But, and it does relate to this, but I don't want to get, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Cause that, that's a, it, it shows that, um, Duchamp didn't know what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at his, there's one, I can't remember where I found it. I think it's on YouTube, but there's one early um, interview with Duchamp where he uh, gives his intention. And this is where um, what, the, what the conceptual artists slowly start to reveal and the postmodern artists in particular get at is this idea that the artist is making decisions is really problematized if you think about 
um, existential philosophy. Hmm. Like uh, what what Heidegger comes and says, like because the modernists are like good Descartian. Um, I think, therefore, I am. Right. And Heidegger comes and says, "Well, whoa, 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 we got to back that sentence yeah. up for a minute. How do you know it's you who's doing the thinking?" Like when you say, I think, mm-hmm. are you sure? Yeah. And then you know me and all of my pseudo psychology <laughs> in, in basic design. It's like, yeah, because I can control your thoughts. Right. So how do you know you're the one doing them? Right. Like I can, I can suggest things. I can make you think of things. I can pump the smell of hamburgers out on the sidewalk and suddenly you're hungry. Mm-hmm. Where'd that come from? Was that you mm-hmm. doing the thinking? Maybe I should get a burger? Or was that like, you know a possession of the spirit of the Hamburglar coming and getting it. <laughs> right, or even, or even those, those, those crazy experiments that they've been doing um, where it's like you, you give somebody a series of questions to answer while they're hooked up to some sort of a, a brain scanning machine and whoever's, on the, whoever's reading the output of the machine can guess what you're about to decide based on the images of your brain like just before you've made the decision yourself. Like they'll give somebody a hard question and they'll say they're going to choose A here, and then sure enough, the person will be like, "I think I'm going with A." Yeah, yeah, it's it's very bizarre. It's it's terrifying and fascinating and all those things. Right, and these so the, these these conceptual artists, um, but they're they're kind of that first step into realizing that what we're doing as artists is far more strange and unique than just making an object. Mm-hmm. We're actually setting up a situation. That primarily is a new is a you could say it's a it's a unique way in which we're interacting with material and a person's work or performance their the way they did something and then also this like realm of meaning it's like a nexus point of reminders <laughs> of course <laughs> it's like a strange web of reminders getting at them um, which leads me so Jonathan is setting up this whole entire thing of basically like look. Conceptual art, first of all, it's not as weird as the artwork itself looks like, mm-hmm. especially if you track kind of the, the logic that they're using. And then he says, well, this opens us up to six kinds of... Uh, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to do that yet. I want to go... I thought... Anyways. But, but he, he points this out to kind of show that abstraction is really different than we think it is that oftentimes abstraction is vilified and people say something like, we're removing the human. Mm -hmm. So abstract art oftentimes, like if you think of Picasso or um, Duchamp's other kind of crazy work, the nude descending the stairs, there's barely anything recognizable as a human being in that. So you could say they've stripped the humanity out of it. Christians and um, Hans Ruckmacher wrote a book called Modern Art and the Death of a Culture, which I vehemently disagree with. Jonathan Anderson wrote a book called Modern Art. Jonathan Anderson, with William Dearness, wrote a book called Modern Art and the Life of a Culture, which I agree with. Um, uh, so what they're saying is that the modern artists are trying to get God or this realm of beauty that is substantiated naturally in the world, and they're trying to find their own beauty. Mm-hmm. And this is very Greenbergian. Yeah. Um, we, we should, probably should have read Greenberg, but... I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> I've read it from our other classes, so I get the I get the point. Yeah, you guys read the new Laocon? Uh, we read we read it was even worse. We read Robert Storr's response to Greenberg's. Oh, <laughs> it was like right. like layers and layers. Interesting, but you know this idea of the avant garde seeking a new right. a new um, kind of model of what art and beauty should be. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, very. Very Benjamin esque, like right. like this is your duty. You are the kind of the soldiers, the new, like the I mean the tip of the spear in right. finding this new way of communicating. Yeah. So Jonathan has a really interesting counter argument to that here, and it's indeed at heart, conceptual art was never interested, as it is sometimes accused, in a withdrawal into abstract asocial concepts. It was primarily oriented toward reconnecting art to the procedures, activities, conceptualities, and materials of everyday life across the various dimensions of common life. So Duchamp's a great, like to, that's all again, academic gobbledygook. Mm -hmm. Um, Duchamp's a great example. What Duchamp thought he was doing was he thought he was putting forward an anti-aesthetic image. 
So he's like a true nihilist, mm -hmm. part of the Dada movement, and he does want to deconstruct and point out how human beings are these weird anomalies in, in the universe and that we're sick and we're gross and we do stupid things. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a gallery, like there's a reason it's the first one's a urinal. He doesn't really get at this. In my opinion, he's trying to say that you go here to see things just as you go to a bathroom. Mm -hmm. So you're going there to do the same activity as you do in a bathroom. Right. But he's trying to, like the thing he says publicly, which almost all histo art historians today ignore, is that he wanted to put forward an anti-aesthetic object, one that was neither ugly or beautiful. He wanted to put forward something that was so neutral, you almost didn't even see it. It's a crazy choice to choose a urinal as your, right. as your neutral right. object. Well, and what's interesting is, so at the time, that's what he thought, and he stopped making the ready-mades because he was failing to do that. Mm -hmm. The fact that 10 students in 2023 saw a urinal and carried it across campus like a holy object or right. like a, like a uh, effigy of this remembered right. object proves that Duchamp did not do that. Yeah. He did not put forward an aesthetically neutral object, and in fact, what he highlights, which is why he's not a modernist, and he's actually, he, he's beyond postmodern. His work is beyond postmodernism, whereas he's a postmodernist. What it highlights is we can't help but make objects meaningful. Right. As soon as he did that to the urinal, it is now meaningful, mm -hmm. even though he meant it not to be that. No, yeah, it's, it's such a, like, it's literally become like a weird totem of our class right. is this, is the, the Voorhees basement urinal. Is yeah. We think it's hilarious. We love it. Yeah, and so it's like the, what Jonathan's getting at here is that we often just think, and, it's, and it is because of, of Greenberg, but also some artists like Duchamp saying, like, they're sick and tired of this religious iconography. They're sick and tired of all of this this you know meta narrative and this meaning all of that is is bs and we cannot know truth and there is no truth which is all postmodernist thought it's going in that direction to try to get rid of that so that is happening i'm not denying that's when i say that when i say i disagree with rookmacher it's not that i believe rookmacher is wrong but that he's only talking about a subsection of modern art modern right. art as a whole is not doing that and that's what jonathan is getting at here is that especially the conceptual artists, because they're not modernists, they're far more in the postmodern realm, um, what they're trying to respond to is this lack of uh, understanding of what the primary object of art is, that it's concept-based. And that's what um, Rosenberg, Ro Rosenberg and, uh, oh, who's the artist? I just lost it. He painted his bed, he, does a, he has a goat, a painted goat as a self-portrait. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid yeah. I'm not familiar. It'll, it'll come back to me in a minute. Yeah. But, but these artists are getting at um, this fact that it, we're not trying to empty it. We're not trying to remove it from the human. I mean, Ad Reinhardt really goes that path. He tries to commit to that and right. makes artwork for robots. Right. Um, but rather that in the stripping down, the simplifying, we're actually still seeing the human, the human we're representing. So what the urinal does is it represents to us the fact that if you put things on pedestals, human beings can't help but make them meaningful. This, uh, that actually brings up another, one of my other favorite Duchamp pieces, which is actually one that I've gotten to, to see in person. And I forget if this was right before or right after the urinal. It was within, within like two or three years of it or something like that. But for a little while, he was making, um, he was taking the, the drains, like just the kind of like little, you can think of like the little chrome drain that'll sometimes be at the bottom of a urinal. And he was making these bronze casts of them and then putting them on ribbons and calling them like artist medallions or artist re uh, rewards or something like that. And my, my favorite one is like this one that's like cast in bronze and made in gold. Uh, and it's just a urinal drain and he calls it like, like the chief artist's medallion. I think it's I think it's brilliant. But again, it's that same idea of like he was trying to make something that was the opposite of aesthetic or the opposite of meaningful. It's like, oh, how can you not be fascinated by that? Of like as an artist, your medallion is like this this little strange coin cast yeah. in bronze that's literally like a part of a bathroom somewhere. Yeah. Like yeah. it's such a such an interesting idea. And well, and especially in this day and age where COVID caused us to really wonder why do we do all these strange things, whether it's handshakes 
or hugs or meetings with people mm -hmm. or trophy ceremonies or graduation ceremonies. Like, why do they exist? What mm -hmm. does it matter? Um, they definitely matter something. I don't know if any of us has a good answer. Right. But it gets at, like, that's what we mean when we're talking about conceptual art. It's not that important that what he made was a cast of a urinal drain. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is, he did that. Mm -hmm. And we sit there and we wonder, why did he do this? Then right. he puts it on a ribbon mm -hmm. and then he says it's an award. And specifically, it's an award for artists. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying, so why, what are you saying when you award an artist a cast bronze or gold or silver urinal drain? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what? Well, first of all, what does that say about like what we're doing as artists? Right. What does that say about an award ceremony? Like, this is what we mean by what what Jonathan means by representation. Right. By changing the forms, by presenting the award ceremony in such a strange, different manner. Right. We start thinking about that more than the object. The object becomes far more of that like that thing that gets us thinking about the symbolic. Mm -hmm. And like that's, that that I think is, um, well, I'm gonna push further than Jonathan does and I'm gonna say, I think that's what makes art special. Right, it's, um, for, because for me, it points at this really, this really interesting idea that I, um, I think, I think, El, was it Elkins who said something about like standing standing on like your pile of trash and being proud of it anyway, something like that in the swim of the pond in the, in the way was rain, wasn't that? Uh, uh, standing on your, I think that was Saunders. Oh, are you talking, right, about, the, are yeah, you talking yeah. about Elkins in uh, Why Art Cannot Be Taught? No, sorry, but we were, I was thinking about Saunders, it was that conversation, yeah. but Saunders talks about, um, well, essentially just like making garbage and being proud of it, like standing on yeah. being like, it's trash, but at least it's mine. My trash, yeah. Yeah, and it's like that idea that's like so interesting to me of like, Oh, as an artist, like like you're given this thing that's like what you're making is trash, but you still get an award for it. Like that's like <laughs> such a such a like a fun a funny idea to me, and it's like so. Right. And you, it's well. Ask me or tell tell me if I'm wrong. So uh -huh. ask ask me this question. <laughs> um, I hear that, and all I can think is Ecclesiastes. Right. All I can think is like, oh, this book that me and these other people who ascribe to this religion. It's representing Ecclesiastes to me. Of course, yeah. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. It's like, you are but a breath. Like, how are Christians not seeing that that is so closely connected to what we believe? Right. And it's like, it's got this element of, like, grossness to it. Cause it's, like, it's like, oh, it's disgusting. It's from a urinal. Urinals are, like, literally the grossest things. Yeah. Like, they're awful every time. But... Yeah. Um, there's still something about that idea that has that humor to it and it's like it's a little bit self-deprecating and at the same time it's got that weird sense of pride where like most artists I know have this this strange kind of um, this like self-awareness that it's like no like you have to admit that what you're doing on some level has this this element of vanity or this element of like like meaningless to it meaninglessness mm. to it mm. and like the idea of like accepting that and, and laughing at it and doing it anyways is a powerful idea yeah yeah uh, we'll we'll get there but i'm just checking the time yeah um we've got plenty of time mm -hmm. that that is hinted at when he goes back around to lewitt and says when lewitt says artists at their core are mystics that's exactly what he's getting at. But before he gets there, so he's finishing up. Conceptual art is doing this, uh, this representation work. It's helping us realize that the point of a work of art is not to demonstrate artist's skill. It's not to make a room more harmonious. It's to make an object that makes us re-see something that is present in the world. Mm -hmm. and, do sh and, and the conceptual artists are focusing most on that. Now... Jonathan would be more even-handedly, even-handed than me. I'm like, I see everything in that framework. That's how I judge the quality of work of art. That's not going to work if I go and look at, you know, French Rococo era paintings. Mm -hmm. that, they had nothing to do with that. They weren't trying to do that. And that's why I don't like them. Uh, but so it's like, you know, a good art historian is switching between methodologies and frameworks in order to say on their own terms, what were they trying to do? 
this, you know, and we'll judge them on that. Right. Um, like, like taking it at face value and, and judging it by the merit that it asks to be judged with in some ways. Right. And what its culture wanted of it. You know, so much of, you know, people always complain right now about the fact that there's so much bad art and, oh, it's because of the democratization of art. You know, we're, we're letting any, anyone who can afford a liberal arts degree can become an artist, um, which it's even more. It's like anyone who has an iPhone can be an artist. And they're saying, well, that's why we're getting all this crap. Because uh, we're, we're hiding the needles inside of this sea of needles. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of that. But it's like that's what culture's for. You look back. Like, I mean, even in its day, Shakespeare was not popular. Mm-hmm. It was a needle in a haystack. But culture, over time, people say, you know, they're moving. And they've got some books. And they've got other books. They've got all these plays on their shelves. And it's like, well, Am I really going to schlep all these plays around again? Mm-hmm. Like, does anyone need to see that one again? And somehow, over time, it's like Shakespeare kept getting saved. Right. And those other ones that we don't even, like you and I as lay people and not like theater aficionados, I don't know anyone else besides Shakespeare who wrote plays in Britain at that time. Yeah. It's yeah. like, that, that's what culture does. So when we look back and we think there were geniuses, giants in the past, it's like, no, there were other people too. Right. And we just like... Th- other people did the work of curating history for us. Right, yeah. It's a, or it's some, um, I think it's survivorship bias is what that's called. It's yeah, essentially yeah. like at the end of the day, all you get is what's left. Um, right. My, my favorite, this is, this is a brief, brief, brief interjection, but I think it explains that point really well is that for years during World War II, there are these planes that would come back. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard this I before. Know, yeah. yeah, but there are these planes that would come back and they'd be riddled with bullet holes. And, of course, they'd be like, oh, so that's where the planes are getting shot, so we're going to build up more armor around yeah. the bullet holes. After a little while, the engineers working on these planes realized that those are all the spots where a plane can get absolutely riddled with machine gun fire and be still fine. somehow make it back right. to the aircraft carrier, and that actually any place where there isn't a bullet hole that's should, really... should have more armor on it. And it's like yeah. that's we're angry at that idea. We don't like that idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we see all exactly. of these, the the billions of awful photos on Instagram that are just meaningless or pictures of a, a grainy photo of somebody's cat. And we're right. like, oh, I don't care. And Which again gets back to that like, uh, you know, uh, Weichbrot's redeeming vision thing. It's like, if you're dissatisfied with your visual milieu, start going to places that are curating the milieu more. Mm-hmm. You know, start following accounts where people are curating. You know, Jonathan Anderson's Instagram account is wonderful. Mm-hmm. It's, it is beautiful work with subtle commentary and it's really interesting but um even it's like that's why you should go to a museum like the curators in general are pretty like intelligent thoughtful people Mm -hmm. who might not know all the reasons why they make the decisions they make but they've thought about how can we present compelling objects so your time here isn't wasted Mm -hmm. and it's like your time your time on this thing is largely wasted Mm -hmm. and it's like so maybe don't do that. Yeah. And that's for everyone, not just viewers, but artists as well. So Jonathan does all of this work to defend conceptual art, which I think is great. I want to go through. He's, he then goes into this manner in which he says, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of the logic of conceptual artists and how it relates to religious thinking. And he does this, I think, quite ecumenically, as in it's not just Christian religious thinking. But he sets up six logics, and I want us to talk about the logics pretty quickly to move on to then his his uh, examples of Chris Martin. But so the first one he says is that uh, the, the conceptual artists highlight a new logic in making art. And, and when he says logic, it's like, a, well, representational art is a type of logic. Set up a, set up a still life and then try to capture it in as close to visual accuracy as possible. Mm-hmm. That's a logic. That's what we're saying. So Jonathan is highlighting that through the practice of conceptual, of, of weighting the conceptual as important in art, you come up with some new logics. Um, and his first one is procedural. What did, you, what did you think about this procedural logic? What was, how did that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, I'll have to look and see. This yeah, is exactly this is page three. Um, this was, oh, just before the Chris Martin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, right here. So the first one, procedural logics. Yeah. Um, all right, so this one, um, the, the idea of the procedural, he, he begins 
and he talks about um, specifically about Judaism and kind of the uh, like the cyclical and the ritualistic aspects of that religious culture, which is mm-hmm. like so much of um, so much of Judaism and so much of the, the beauty of Judaism is the like these traditions which have been happening for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years and the, these practices and procedures, you could call them, that just keep on happening with the same objects and the same meaning and the same words over and over and over again, like mm-hmm. that tradition. And his link to that is, uh, of course, this idea of um, Soloit and his, his set of instructions, right? Like if you think about it, the Passover dinner or a Seder dinner is a set of instructions that people have been following every year in the same way that a Solowit drawing gets made. Like yeah. the, the, I guess you could say, while the, the actual holding of the dinner is important, there's this concept of the Seder dinner and the Passover and the, the flight from Egypt and all those things that are like what's actually important. It is Right. You can think about like if your goal as a conceptual artist is to represent something, you can start presenting things that aren't, physical objects Mm -hmm. you know I can I you know like you think about the prodigal son Rembrandt's prodigal son represents the prodigal son returning and being hugged and the brother on the side and all the things we talked about Mm -hmm. right well but if I don't have to represent something can I represent what does it mean to be a prodigal Mm -hmm. or can like can I start getting even more kind of not as specific so a great example would be something like well you know, you have Catholic friends. I have Catholic friends. They have a practice where they go in. It's a procedure mm-hmm. where they go in. They say something to a priest. The priest says, you know, your sins are forgiven. Go and do this. And then they get out their rosary and they do this thing mm-hmm. that they do a lot. Yeah. What's the point of that? What is that procedure supposed to produce? Well, it's a procedure of uh, confession and then atonement, right? A confession yeah. and then being, penance. Yeah, giving, being forgiven and taking right. the set of actions to do that. So someone like LeWitt in particular is looking at spiritual practices and traditions around him and realizing, well, there's all of these procedures that they go through mm-hmm. and they produce things. Like I, I think every Catholic and even psychologists are looking at these religious practices and saying, yeah, they, they do something. Mm-hmm. It's not nothing. Now... That I'm not saying that it's necessarily talking to God. I believe it is. But, you know, it's doing something and it has an effect. And so then we sit here and we think, well, when we're thinking about art making, we want them to come up with their own new procedure that produces a work of art. Mm-hmm. It's like, why? Like if, if the same ritual over and over produces that effect over there, why can't we do the same for art? Right. Aren't we limiting what we can do with art if we're always saying every time you go up to the canvas, you have to do something new? It's like, what if every time you go up to the canvas, you do the same thing over and over? Mm -hmm. And now you could start seeing, okay, well, that's why Rothko had so many of the same paintings. Right. (laughs) And and it's well, and I think that is a little bit of a of a double edged sword because there's. I think I think so much of especially kind of performance art is asking that question of like, right. what happens if I keep on doing it? And then after the point of me being tired of doing it, I decide to keep on doing it. And then after that, I keep on doing it. Like, it's like that right. that question of, and then I think that what's so interesting is more often than not, the uh, it turns out something really does change. Like, like yeah. even, even if something visual different might not be happening, sometimes like, Sometimes something visual really does happen, and regardless, something changes there. Right, and it's like, so Jonathan is highlighting this, and then he's saying, they're doing the same thing mm-hmm. you religious people are doing. Right, like, I mean... Whether it's your prayers, whether it's your liturgy, whether it's your confessions, whether it's uh, spinning a prayer bell or mm-hmm. a prayer wheel, whether it's making a mandala, the conceptual artists are seeing a broader perspective of what a procedure to make artwork can be. Right. And it's, it's like... It's like taking, looking at religious practice and being like, well, let's do this procedure in this realm. Yeah. And, and I it's think, like, how are, how are religious people not fascinated by that? It is. It's like uh, the idea of um, some of the people that I know who are like lifelong Catholics, like if you talk to them about this, this sort of thing, or you talk to them about like, um, to me, communion is like probably the, the most interesting one to talk to people about because it is like something that lifelong Catholics will have done every week of sometimes their entire you know, for 60 years. 
and oftentimes they'll they'll talk about how much um, communion has changed for them and why they still love doing it after you know doing it from their first communion to their like their old age. It's that same thing where it's like oh something something changes here or you have a new yeah. understanding of communion every every year or maybe you won't have a new understanding of communion but then after 20 more years of doing communion all of a sudden you'll be like oh now i'm now i'm really starting to understand communion yeah yeah which then gets into the second so so we've got this sense of like it opens up a broad amount of ritual repetition Mm -hmm. redoing things turning yourself into a machine perhaps Mm -hmm. that reproduces a work of art it does so many things to blow out what an artwork can be and expand it through almost a contraction. Mm -hmm. This is what Jonathan is getting at is that abstraction doesn't actually strip away. It sort of like distills, boils it down. And what that means is suddenly we get, you know, instead of having a soup, we've got like a sauce. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my God, this sauce can go on so many more things. Yeah. (laughs) It's not just a beef stew. (laughs) Now it's like this, you know, it can go on top of a Wellington. It can, you know. (laughs) It's, um, it's actually, I've always, I've always taken issue with, uh, what we call representational art that's been Mm -hmm. that's always been such a strange word to use for it because in some ways my my personal experience has been that abstraction can be much more representational right Mm -hmm. like we talk about that in um in design and graphic design all the time that oftentimes abstracting and simplifying something oftentimes makes it into like a universal signifier which i would Mm -hmm. argue is much more representational than the specific rendering of, let's say, like a singular apple. Well, yeah, but that's because you're a Christian and you're closer to a Neoplatonist in that sense. Like what you're saying is like chair is less about a specific chair and more about the idea of what a chair is. Mm-hmm. And you've had too many in my classes. That's, that's probably uh, the, the real, so the, the, the largest that, but you're, But yeah, you're exactly right. That's, what, that's why I always talk about in my classes how, um, especially in the sense of design, cliche is not bad. Mm-hmm. It's just you need to understand what a cliche is. It's we know exactly what it means. There's yeah. no mystery left in the cliche. So when students make cliche artwork, it's like, good job. We know what that is. Mm-hmm. And we're interested in ideas and we want to see new ideas. You just presented cliche ideas. Yeah. But if you're trying to you know, communicate when there's a fire, this is the door you exit out of, you better use a cliche idea. Yeah. Make it red. Make it big. Make it flash. <laughs> make like, it, show, show somebody running away from a fire. Yeah, like exactly. That. <laughs> you know, In like, case you can't read anything, <laughs> you can see this is a person, right? Yeah. Running. It's like, that's the point to put those at. Yeah. And then, you know, there's all kind of, like, I love Stefan Sagmeister talking about how can you then, like, make the use the vernacular of cliche to make funny things but uh that's neither here nor there yeah but so this gets to his second thing which the second thing the second logic developed is presentational logics um this is this uh this idea that um i mean it's exactly what we're talking about here is that as soon as you're realizing that representation is that with conceptual art you can just be representing it opens up tons of categories of how we literally show that this is art. Mm-hmm. What did you? What were like? Did, how would you elucidate what he's getting at? Here? <laughs> Sorry, I got I got totally distracted because I read that that second line and he used the word crypto relic logic, which I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to parse yes. what that might yes. mean. But he's getting at this. So relic in particular. He's mm-hmm. so um, the conceptual artists are so like a, a great example would be um, Joseph Boys does weird stuff with animal fat and felt. And then, especially now that Boys is gone, those things are presented like relics. And so Boys, he's looking at Catholic relic, reliquaries in particular, and thinking about like, you've got, you know, whatever. All, oftentimes the relics are like the foreskin of some saint. Like, you know, but they're like fingers and yeah, it's like bones or like weird, like like a, a chunk of wood that maybe belonged to a cross that somebody was crucified on. Like these very right. strange things. Yeah, they're, they're like, they're nothing. Yeah. But they've got somehow like an essence of, of a, a sub, substance is the word. I'm like. They've got like a substance of what that thing was somehow, whether that's spiritual or physical is is really if you're a Protestant or a Catholic mm-hmm. um, or an Orthodox. Uh, and so you're, you're like, but we know this object is important. And based on what you believe it is, you present it in a different way. 
So a great example would be the way most museums present tribal objects that have in some manner, most often in uh, nefarious manners, arrived in Western museums. Mm -hmm. We present them like they're some sort of specimen. You yeah. Know? It's like, but this in its context is a holy object, it's meaningful, or it's sacred, or something like that. And it's like, what they're realizing, if, if we're not trying to represent something, and we're trying to present you with an idea, this drastically opens up the field of ways in which I say to you, look at this work of art. Hmm. I don't just put it in a gold gilded frame. Maybe it's on the ground. Maybe it's in a coffin. Maybe it's upside down. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's at the bottom of the ocean. Like suddenly it's like, oh, all of those are potential moments for us to find more meaning. Because mm -hmm. it's like, if you take a Rembrandt and you submerge it in the sea, it's different now. <laughs> it means something else, you right? Know? I mean, it's the same thing of like, the Dada artists were the princes and, and princesses of this, of like, you know, little, little Salvador Dali mustache on Mona Lisa. Yeah. Um, you know, like all, all of that, makes us think about Mona Lisa differently. Right. And makes us think about how it changes. Um, but to me, it's like, again, spiritual traditions are constantly doing this, at least in the, in the less traditional traditions. So, you know, Protestant evangelicalism mm -hmm. or, or Zen Buddhism um, are taking ideas that we do, that we've had through our tradition. And, you know, the hymn, and then like, well, let's add drums, let's add right. guitar, let's, you know, loosely have, uh, you know, maybe we're going to repeat it for 30 minutes. Well, I think, I think for me what this calls to, calls to mind is, especially in Christianity, which um, in, in so many Christian, tradi Christian traditions, what you're looking at is like essentially a, a bunch of different folk religions kind of inside of a trench coat and then like the Christian kind of like over overlaid over top of it where it's like some really interesting imagery and and cultural ways of expressing stories from the Bible mm -hmm. come about from like um, come about from like what happens when when these things start to collide and get recontextualized or represented right like so mm -hmm. much of um, uh, Celtic like Celtic Christian imagery right is almost directly appropriated like Celtic pagan imagery. Yeah. But then you have these these beautiful overlaid and interwoven crosses and Celtic yeah. knots and, and strange stories and right. the saints and how they are oftentimes more mythological figures that have kind of been appropriated. It's like that's that's when things start to get interesting and people really are able to connect and find meaning as like right, right. as well, as things are represented. Yeah, you're, and you're kind of mixing the fifth one, which is appropriation. But I want to point out something like when mm. art served whatever the dominant religion of a people group was, it was like, where would you put the art? In the church, in right. the temple. Like there's one place to present it. Mm -hmm. you know, when it served the authority, the, you know, the, the, the nation state or the emperor or the king or mm -hmm. queen or whatever, where would you put it? In the public square. Yeah. It's like when art serves any idea that comes to mind, where do you put it? Anywhere. Right. It might be like, there's a, uh, mm. Carl Sagan, one of the most prolific mystics and conceptual artists of the past century, like he put together a project to send a spaceship into space with like all of this weird stuff on this disc. Do you know about the disc? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. got like mathematic coordinates to how to get here. Images of the male and female body, um, which is problematic these days. Shame on him. Uh, you know, music, like all of these different things. Because he's, he's literally thinking like, man, if there's aliens out there, how do I present them with something that tells them who we are and please come visit us? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's gold. Not because gold is beautiful but because gold doesn't bond with anything. Yeah. As in it's, it's perfectly, what, do you know what that's called? You're an engineer. Oh man. It's <laughs> or you a, used it's, to be an engineer. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like inert. It's not yeah, reactive. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't tarnish. It doesn't. Yeah. So it's like, no matter what, when that thing gets there, you'll still be able to see it. Mm -hmm. It's like, talk about an idea of where can artwork go? 
mm -hmm. space. <laughs> right, yeah, it's like a... You can also, I mean, you've got that, and then you've got a less brilliant conceptual artist who sends a Tesla into space. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But that's still a conceptual artist. It is. It is. It's a. It's a. They're both interesting concepts. There's. Yeah. I know which one I hope the aliens find first. <laughs> as yeah, well. that so, Tesla would be real cool. <laughs> yeah, they'll get a lot of use to that. They've got like eight tentacles. It's like what? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> they're like maybe maybe it's a missile. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a threat. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, so then uh, his third thing is before we get to. Uh, Appropriation, right? Performative logics. What was we've we've we're already brushing on this, but yeah, what would you get out of that? We're starting to we're starting to mix and match here a yeah, lot yeah. Um, as as we do. Um, so his his third one. Um, I, I wasn't actually super familiar with this artist or the work of art. Oh, you'll love Salcedo. Okay, I'll I and I didn't have I didn't have time to go into every artist that he mentions in this article, but yeah. um, what he talks about here are. Um, in some ways, we did already really brush on it with this kind of idea of ritual and repetition yeah. again and again. But he's talking about like labor and and um, investing yourself into a process, like right the process. So it's it's different than um, the the not the present the um, procedural things. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of the procedure, uh, you know, how does something go about making it? Mm -hmm. Is it through repetition? Is it through generating a system? Is it through playing a game? All these different things that, like, uh, you know, like for example, the Book of Hours is a is a procedure mm -hmm. in the many Christian traditions, and it has kind of a choose your own adventure kind of style in some traditions where, you know, sometimes you're reading this prayer, other days you might read this prayer prayer, but they they work at the same time, so it's like a mix and match thing. So that's all procedure based, but this is process based. So Salcedo does all kinds of strange things. He describes here where she's making a shroud out of rose petals that are stitched together. Mm -hmm. It's like when we think pre 1905, basically, mm -hmm. when we think of someone making art, it's like, oh, uh, you know, marble, maybe wood if, if you know, they're poor, uh, clay, paint you know, um, plaster for frescoes. We're thinking those things. Yeah. That's what you do. That's what you, you work with. The performance is learning how to put, how to mix paint and putting it on canvas. Suddenly it's like, well, if we're representing things, like we, can't we open up what the performance aspect is? It's like, what do I, what do I do? And also what do I do it with? Mm -hmm. So it's like Salcedo is like stitching, but not fabric, not making clothing. I'm not making, you know, tapestries, although she kind of is, mm -hmm. but rather rose petals. So suddenly it's like the performance of the thing starts to influence its meaning. The fact that Rembrandt used oil paints is not that much different than Titian, than, you know, Munk, than anyone who uses oil right. paints. The practice, the, the performance, does not affect the impact of the work. The fact that Salcedo takes stitching and does it with rose petals, that performance alone adds meaning to the work. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's like, what um, if modernism is like narrowing to some extent when it gets to abstraction, it's realizing that, look, there's all these other tools in our toolkit that we didn't realize we could use to encounter more meaningful things. Yeah. One of those things is the manner in which you do something, the performance of that task can bring meaning. I think this is a spot where, um it, it links really clearly to a lot of uh, Eastern Eastern religious practices where yeah. it's like you have these entire orders and monasteries and stuff like that where like their meditative practices will be based around doing some physical the physical task which oftentimes might have like a, a real purpose kind of in like in the, the daily upkeep of the monastery or whatever order they're a part of but it'll be something like that level of labor intensive like carrying water with a bucket or like doing something like so tedious by hand i think especially about um uh like the practices of like rock gardens and bonsai mm -hmm. and like sand um what, what are they called where they, they do those intricate like like sand raking patterns 
Uh, so those would be just um, Zen gardens. Right. Zen, there's so, different ones, but sand, rocks. Yeah. 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 So that's like, that's what I think of is like this mm-hmm. level of like the attention to detail. And I mean, I think it's, it's really hard to, for me personally, it's really hard to look at those not as some form of performance art or some mm-hmm. form of like, yeah. they're, they're incredible. And yeah, this is where I'm like, so again, I, like another one though is, um, in the Judeo-Christian uh, canon, there are these weird guys who sometimes have to do extremely strange things because God told them. Mm. We call them prophets, right. usually. Uh, there's two in particular that stand out, but then there's Ezekiel. Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah does some weird stuff, but Ezekiel does some really weird stuff. Like, lay on your side for like 200 days to, and then lay on your other side for, two, for like 80 days and... Um, then your those numbers aren't accurate, but some theologian's gonna we'll get a comment about <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, and then also while you're doing that, you're only allowed to eat bread that was cooked over poop. Mm-hmm. And, and at first, it's human poop, and he's like, "Please, God, don't make me perform <laughs> the action of eating bread cooked over human poop." And God's like, "Fine, cow poop." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh. Like even in our religious tradition, we know that the way you perform an action. The way you lay down and why, the manner in which you do it, changes its meaning. Mm-hmm. It's like the manner, like uh, it's so connected to a religious tradition. Right. Yeah. I mean, the. Uh, I mean, to 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 bring this all together, I think almost every religion that I can think of, and even folk religions, folk traditions have fasting mm-hmm. as a part of their as a part of their rituals in some way, shape or form. And that's like, that's like such a clear example of this kind of idea where it's like, oh yeah, clearly the, the act of abstaining from taking in food does something. And everybody's kind of focused on that. Like that's, that's, that's universal. Yeah. Then we get into, so the fourth one, Mm -hmm. site specificity and what he calls, uh, he, Jonathan, uh, italicizes histories of a place, Mm -hmm. but he's kind of getting at this sense that um, what artists start doing is uh, most artwork that is like pre-1900 is uh, coming in and defining a place. So um, the Catholic the Catholic uh, basilicas and cathedrals all around Europe are a perfect example of how like you go into one and it's got, you know, a Caravaggio over in this chapel. Mm-hmm. It's like the Caravaggio is defining that chapel. Mm-hmm. It's the chapel where you see that painting. And yeah. also it's the chapel where you, you know, whatever, say this kind of prayer. Or like St. Peter's is the place where the Pieta is. Mm-hmm. You know, like all of those artworks, it's almost like they impact the space mm-hmm. and they change the manner in which the space functions. And we've seen that like artwork does that all the time. But suddenly when you get into the conceptual artists, they start realizing, wait, 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 an artwork can actually highlight what a place already is. Mm-hmm. You know, we can, we can go in and not change a place, but we can, well, it's still a change, but not like come in with an external force and be like, this random room that I hung my painting is now about my painting. Mm-hmm. Instead, what if, you know, what if you're going into Auschwitz and you don't want to deny what Auschwitz was. And so what do you do to set up something that gets at the site specificity and history of Auschwitz? And that's what all of those, those atrocity museums in particular, they're conceptual works of art. Mm-hmm. It's like a pyramid of children's shoes that they found there, that's a conceptual work of art. Mm-hmm. It's, it's looking at the site and saying, how do we make manifest the history that was here? Mm-hmm. And that's a really poignant example but there are tons of other manners in which artists today are working with site specificity, not to say like, here I am and aren't I awesome. Well, that's mostly what's happening today, <laughs> but especially the earthwork artists that were, that were working um, through the 70s, 70s to like 2000s, oftentimes what they're trying to do is research a location and understand what it was once perceived as, mm-hmm. and then figuring out a way to like elucidate that in some manner, um, which is just, Again, it's completely radical, but it's also tied to what especially proselytizing churches are doing. I was going to say it's completely radical and at the same time, another one of those universal things where like people have been uh, at its most basic form 
putting putting standing rocks in strange shapes to mark out specific places yeah. like for as long as we've we've been around like yeah. Stonehenge and Easter Island every pyramid like like more and more as we learn about these places um, we find out that it's less about the fact that oh this is a good spot to build a pyramid and more that no it's important that there's a pyramid here for some reason like, right right it like highlights it, what this place is it highlights that place was already important or it's like doing something on top of a mountain top it isn't it isn't that you're saying i'm going to put my piece of artwork deserves to be on a mountain top it's saying this is so that you really know that you're on a mountain top yeah oh man there's such a good essay um called sculpture in the expanded field why can't i remember who wrote it um, creates this whole entire grid of like, look, when we start thinking conceptually, there are way more types of sculpture than we think about. And um, that, that's, what, that's what the author is getting at with this, that idea is when you start thinking about site specificity and how the history of a place can impact what you do there, it just expands what you can do so much. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, yeah, oh, I love it. I, if we had time, that's, that would be another one that we'd read. But this is, again, like, uh, if it's not already obvious to people and to you, I am way more interested in postmodern art theorists mm. than I am in modern art, art theorists. Because mm -hmm. by and large, I think modernity did this weird focusing, saying abstraction is a stripping away and not a distilling. Mm -hmm. And then the postmodernists are are far more interested in this idea of concept. And what it does is it drastically explodes the manner in which we can think about making objects and experiences and places, making the invisible embodied in really unique ways. Um, yeah, one of the, uh, one last example of that is in, in Germany, there are these, um, I don't, I don't speak any German, but the literal transla translation is stumbling stones, mm. which is essentially it's a, a, a paving block which has been taken out and then cast in metal and then raised slightly. And they're um, inscribed with the names of Jewish families who were taken from their homes or whose businesses were destroyed. And so they're raised slightly and they're put in front of these places. So they're literally these spots where you have to look down not to trip over, yeah. over like the history that was right there. And I've always been struck with that as like, what a, what a poignant way of like forcing people to contend with like the history of the spaces that they're living yeah. in or the, yeah. and, and I don't know, it, it's such a, 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 in some ways like nuanced and also incredibly direct way of like keeping people aware. Right. It's like that's, that's the power of this idea of being site specific. Yeah, oh, that's a good example. Um, the fifth one is appropriation. Now, Jonathan makes a good point here to try and point out that um, oftentimes when we hear appropriation, we think of it negatively. Mm. He's trying to get at it in a neutral sense of like appropriation is the taking of a, a form. I'm going to call it a visual form since we're talking about visual arts, but it can be way more than that. Mm -hmm. um, taking of a form that is not necessarily one's own and reusing it in a different manner. Sometimes this is done in, I would call it a derogatory manner. Right. Um, I would call that something like misappropriation. Um, and then sometimes it's done in a manner that is neutral. Sometimes it's done in a manner that's positive. Um, that celebrates the thing um, more than that. But he's, he's talking about how, like, we think of, especially in the modernist era, we're thinking about the artist as someone who makes new things. Right. I set forward with my brush, and it is like a spear piercing the dark, yeah. and there I, I, f I shape the future. <laughs> um, but uh, what this is realized, what, what this, this idea that representation, you know, we're thinking about art as primarily about what it means it's like well there are things that exist they already mean things mm -hmm. rather than making my own new thing that means you know jesus i can use an image of jesus because <laughs> right. it already exists it right. already means that thing yeah it's like you know rather than saying i want to get at the fact that medallions are meaningful awards like rather than making your own new meaningful award system, you just take the meaningful award system and now you turn it into urinal cake thing and uh, suddenly it means something different. But right. you appropriated the award ceremony. Right, right. And we've, we've talked about this a little bit before with the idea of 
creativity in general and remixing right and it's like what what humans do is they appropriate like that's yeah. that's we're, we're mimetic creatures as uh, Gerard would say but like that's that's what we do is we see things we take them we mimic them that's how yeah. we learn everything we know right and of course the appropriation can be disrespectful and awful um, every Halloween <laughs> we're, we're not too far away from it happening but um, at the same time it's like that's just how how we work and that's that's what is needed often to create meaningful imagery is is kind of grabbing from all these different spots right right and in my I don't I, I always just want to point out I'm like uh, it's not that the conceptual artists were discovering these things mm-hmm. these things are present in every artwork the conceptual artists are realizing these things mm-hmm. as in oh wait a minute that's already happening. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Caravaggio is a great example. The, uh, most people know, you, you'll put these up, but most people know um, Michelangelo's creation of Adam. And mm-hmm. we know Adam's hand. There, I'll do it so the camera can see. <laughs> yeah. You know? And hey, the, for the camera, this is coming from the right side, I think, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyways, so Adam's over on the left, and he's reaching out, uh, maybe withdrawing, maybe touching God. Who knows? Caravaggio is a good Catholic, really interesting painter. And then he's got Jesus. Uh, there's a great painting of Jesus calling Matthew, I believe. Um, and of course, Jesus is in, he's on the right hand side now. Um, Jonathan has a great exposition of this in one of his uh, art history class lectures, by the way. Um, and Jesus is coming from the other side, from God's side. There's a thing of darkness in between them. And then there's this hand. Mm-hmm. It's Adam's hand, not God's hand. So Caravaggio appropriates Michelangelo's hand of Adam, and it's in Jesus reaching from the other side with that same hand mm-hmm. pointing at Matthew, and Matthew then pointing at himself. Mm-hmm. And it's like Caravaggio is getting at an idea there, a meaningful idea. Right. Jesus is second Adam. Jesus is Adam's hand. J- Adam's hand being in the place of God. Adam's hand reaching across to the tax collector. Yeah. It's like all of that appropriation was already happening. It's the conceptual artists who realize, wait, 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 this is what we can be doing. Mm-hmm. I can be an appropriation artist who functions mostly in this logic. Right, or, or it's like even if you think about um, iconography in any form, whether or not that's you know the fact that Mary is always depicted blue or that um, in ancient Egyptian artwork, there's there's animal headed gods on every wall. Like right. it's like that's that's just how we work. It's like we an idea somehow captures some part of our imagination, and it's like well that's that's just how it is. Like that's that's how yeah. we're going to make it from this point forward. Well, and you can see too. Uh, the other thing to think about is that these logics aren't necessarily things that we have to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, so appropriation is one of those weird ones. Like a great example is the swastika. The swastika was appropriated by the Nazis, and it did not mean Nazism. Mm-hmm. Now it does. Yeah. It's like it got appropriated and used for something else. And now, like I think I've discussed this in these discussions, but like when I was in Japan, the first Shinto shrine I went to go look at had a swastika on it. And my immediate thought was, oh my God, they were making shrines during the war when they were aligned with the Nazis. And it was like, wait, 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 no, no, no. This isn't in the right orientation. It's yeah. flipped backward. Oh, this is an original swastika. Yeah. Like this is what the swastika originally meant. But it's so powerfully, it was so powerfully misappropriated that I can hardly access that original meaning. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that like, you know, coming back to the morals or ethics of an artist, they have to think about. But unfortunately, most people who are interested in misappropriating I don't think they care too much about <laughs> ethics. Um, at least no. the Nazis certainly didn't. Um, this gets to the sixth and final one, which is uh, structural, uh, a structural logic. So in many instances, the religious points of reference are more subtle, but also more central to the structural logic of the work. Um, he highlights uh, uh, Anne Hamilton's work here um, and uh, some Cornelia Parker, uh, just getting at the manner in which something is um, made. So, uh, well, the, the best example that he gives here is, um, I think it's Parker's anti-mass, yeah. 
Parker's anti-mask consists of the burnt wooden remains of an African-American Baptist church in Kentucky that was destroyed by arsonists. Parker presents these artifacts of racist violence, truly an anti-mask, suspended in midair in the form of a huge cube. So that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting structure. Why on earth does she do this? Because the Holy of Holies in Judaism is a cube. Mm -hmm. It's like, and you can also see this, the Kaaba in Mecca is a cube. Mm -hmm. So when the, what, what he means about structure is like the manner in which we put something together, the form it takes on, suddenly it's like we have all kinds of more options available to us. Mm -hmm. It's not just rectangular painting on the wall, painting on the fresco on the ceiling, sculpture in the round, in an alcove. It's like, no, we can do, we can do videos, we can do photography, we can, do, uh, we can take a photo and wrap it around a cube. You know, it's like you can, I've made prayer wheels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like there's all kinds of forms that now it's, it's kind of appropriation, but it's not the same as taking a urinal. Like right. you could go make a, a cool urinal sculpture out of, I don't know, cheese. Yeah, yeah, you can do anything. But it's, but it's that idea of through the taking of that structure, like you're able to... to or mimicking of structure. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry, yeah, mimicking, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're able to, um, I mean, I, it comes directly back to the, to the nexus and the map. It's like you're able to all of a sudden connect your idea to all of these other points on the map and do something really, really powerful. Either, you're either to strengthen or subvert the ties between those other, yeah. those other things. Yeah, and you can see like at its core, this is what so much of creativity throughout all of uh, all art forms histories are doing. So like Don Quixote is taking on structures of um, the 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 what is it called the knight the knight errant mm -hmm. the knight errant stories he's taking on these love notions these fantasy notions he's taking those structures to create something new a novel mm -hmm. I mean it's all like I said in that in that everything is a remix video you know we're taking from the past we're copying it we're transforming it we're combining it with different things and what that causes is this realization that I can take structures that are something else I can take you know. Like the amount of artists who have made their own version of what a crucifix is. They're taking the structure of the crucifix that is given to them through the traditions of Christianity and they're completely making it into something new. Sometimes that makes Christians mad. Sometimes it makes them happy. Sometimes they don't even know they did it. When you put it in piss, it makes people real mad. <laughs> even, if you were trying, even if you were trying your hardest to make them happy. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, but like Jonathan is highlighting how what the conceptual artists have done is revealed, you could call it, like he calls them logics. I would say like strategies, strategies of meaning making. Mm -hmm. And also said, look, these are the same strategies of meaning making that every religion employs. Mm -hmm. He's showing that there's a bridge, there's a connection between these two. Uh, he says, uh, art critics and historians. Oh, and th this is, so he, he points all of that out. Then he kind of highlights a problem. First of all, why is he like one of the first people to write about this? And it's, it's a good question, I would say. <laughs> it is, yeah. But he points this out. He says, um, such developments are perhaps surprising in social and artistic contexts that otherwise seem pervasively post-Christian, and they present significant interpretive challenges. What are the challenges of interpreting conceptual and contemporary art? Art critics and historians, and often the curators of such exhibitions, are generally reluctant or unprepared to engage these developments in an extended way. In short, what he's saying there is most of these art world people don't actually understand religion anymore. Because of that, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. I've literally had this said to me about almost every curator I've ever worked with about my work. They're like, I, I know this like means something, but I, that doesn't matter. They don't get it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like what Jonathan is pointing out is that we have... Um, well, I would say it's like my passion is for people of all religions to re-engage with contemporary arts. Hopefully they realize, oh my God, they're doing some of the same things I do when I go to church or synagogue or temple or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's drastic connections. And the interesting thing is that we actually have a better understanding of these actions than most people in that world. Because most people in that world are... Uh, 
vehemently against religion mm-hmm. uh, for all kinds of reasons. Right. I'm not going to criticize them for doing that. Yeah. But I'm going to point out that that is in the sense of if, if Weichbrod is right and we need an archive in order to interpret work, those people have an incomplete archive. Mm-hmm. We have, we as in religious folk, have broader archives. But the religious folk are missing the part of the archive that the art folk have. I was going to say so, but then on the exact flip side of that, if you, if you in the same way that a, a curator might look at one of your pieces of art and say, I know this means something, but I don't care, I could show any one of my, my friends at Hillsdale uh, an Ad Reinhardt painting, and they would say, I understand this means something, but I don't care. It's the exact same conversation. Just That's for, why you don't start with Reinhardt, first of all. <laughs> well, like, I, I oh don't think... God. <laughs> but regardless, it's that same, it's that same yeah. idea of any yeah. postmodern, modern conceptual art. Uh, I would say, the, like, again, the last 150 years of art is like, that's that's the discourse that's happening is these two people screaming i don't i don't understand you at each other yeah yeah and you're the problem yeah Mm -hmm. um and sometimes people have i mean that has not been a good conversation over the last 150 years Mm -hmm. Um, like i think we've we have gone out of our way to constantly mention that we're also we're of a group that is also guilty as contemporary of course yeah Um, but this gets at so jonathan sees all of this and then he uses chris martin he co- this section is called Chris Martin's Representations as an example to try to bridge that gap, to mm-hmm. try to reach out to people and say, like, look at what this guy's doing. Isn't this interesting? Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you make of, of Chris Martin's work? Like, he does yeah. all kinds of weird stuff, and you said you liked it. He does. He does. Um, so this is my first time looking at Chris Martin's work, and I really, really like, um, I think, every piece I've seen of his so far. But... There are these very strange things. Um, uh, the one that I'm looking at right now is one that Anderson references specifically, which is the um, uh, the Ghent altar piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and what we're looking at, and this will be up on the screen, is um, Martin calls it altar, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, which is the the framework or the structure of a of a Christian altar piece with nothing in it. There's no there's yes. no painting, there's no anything inside of it. We're just looking at these these lines. Yeah. So on one hand you could take this a real reduction reductionary modernist point of view. I mean it's it's really it's akin to the materials of the modernists. It's mm-hmm. very Richard Sarah esque with just being metal, mm-hmm. very sparse forms. Um, do you think in your interpretation of this piece, do you think that he's just trying to say like isn't this a nice structure? I don't, I don't think so, because the other thing that's important about this piece is that it also comes back to the idea of being site-specific, and it's mm-hmm. installed in specific locations and also always installed outdoors, I believe he said. I think, yeah, I think always he, outdoors. Yeah. So, and the, the result is, um, for me at any rate, it's much less about this actual structure, and I'm looking through each altar piece window and and seeing the background yeah. as as an image that is now contained within an altar, like in this one yeah. in particular, um, it's installed in front of in front of a cathedral, and like in the main the main sections in the main kind of triptych, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at the front of a cathedral as if it were yeah. the altar. Yeah, I like it much better with the clouds behind it. Go, oh. yeah, go to the cloud one. It's up, up a little bit. Yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah. There. There's one on that's the beach. on the beach. Yeah. Um, so, do you know any of the history of the Ghent altar piece in particular? I, I don't actually. Yeah. This is um, stolen by the Nazis. Um, I believe they've recovered all of it now, but it took a long time. Hmm. Um, if you ever watch the terrible movie, though it's about a good story, uh, the Monument Men, the guy, it's a Kevin, not a Kevin, uh, who's the, George Clooney, that's the one the ladies like. Um, <laughs> it's a George Clooney movie, it's a dumb movie, but in it, they're searching for the Ghent altar piece. Hmm. So the Nazis steal it, um, and it's it's a very so there's all kinds of things there about the fact that it's gone, mm-hmm. the fact that it's empty is attaching itself to that history, taking the structure of it, but then also the emptying out, but then also thinking about like um, this piece is so much like just because it's gone is it really gone, mm-hmm. you know? And and if we take its structure and put it somewhere else, when we get like the clouds behind that. 
Is that different? Is it different than what the altarpiece was? Or is it actually getting at something also uniquely interesting, especially right. in the sense of the Christian mantra or the Christian theology of the incarnation? Yeah. And the fact that these icons and these altarpieces are getting at some manner in which the realm of the sacred and ideal and transcendental and metaphysical came in connection. And it's like, well, now we take the sacred form and we make it so that it's not representing the physical, but it actually is a new way to look at the physical. Mm -hmm. You can look at the horizon through the altar. Right. It's like, if, if that's not like a, a good sermon message right there, is use this as a window to look at the world. It's, yeah. I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really, I'm like, it's, it's such a, um, for one, it's, it's a really, you know, in, in critiques we're always told like, oh, don't just, don't just say that it's beautiful, don't just say that it's pretty, but it is. It's a really beautiful piece of like, this is a beautiful image in a lot of ways. Like, it's, yeah. it's great to look at, but at the same time, it's like, well, now that I'm looking at the water and the clouds, um, through through this lens, like it, it calls to mind all of the biblical stories of the the Sea of Galilee or Jesus walking on water. And I'm imagining like, oh, what would it be like to see these things happening in real life through these structures? Or, yeah. or what would it look like to see some of the things like the ascension happening in those top altars? Like mm -hmm. it, it gives me a way where now I've I'm looking at the seascape and looking at the beach and imagining what would happen if the biblical stories that I've heard about happened right here. Yeah. And again, that's like, if, if you're a Christian and you're not interested in that idea, I don't, I don't know. Well, it's because no Christian art was made after 1900. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's like, it's like you need to, I, I think, I think, I think if like my friends who I talk to so often about this sort of thing, like experience this in the same way that I do, they would probably be very taken by it. I yeah. think I, I would hope so. And there's also a bit where it's like, um, what the conceptual artists allow it, allow to have happen is that because we're not representing something as specific, but we're representing something more you general, mm -hmm. um, it also allows for a, a legitimate critique, for someone to come in and say, it is a shame that the beauty and skill and craftsmanship of the Ghent altarpiece is gone. Mm. It's like, that, that is true. We are missing the Ghent altarpiece. Mm -hmm which is why I'm glad we still have the Ghent altarpiece. <laughs> and this. Because I can go look at that yeah. and this, exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the things is like, it's not, I, I am frustrated by the narrative through the 20th century of like the new Laocon, of we are searching something that is better so we can forget the past. It's like, no, 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 don't forget the past. Mm -hmm. We need it. Like all of us artists need it. We mm -hmm. have to build off of it. Um, uh, John Jonathan has a great kind of quote to get at this in this paragraph where he's talking about Mar Martin's use of, of Christian and non-Christian imagery. And he says, at any rate, either, so he's speaking of, of Martin's work, either de-theologizing or re-theologizing human agony in a way that sends viewers into an undetermined range of casual explanations other than the ones provided by the ancient Laocon narrative. Uh, sorry, he's, he's speaking specifically about the Laocon piece in this. But mm -hmm. I like that, that sense of de-theologizing or re-theologizing. I think it's up. Mm -hmm. um, the Laocon without the, yeah, without without, the snake. Without the snake. Um, so in this one in particular, he's taking, uh, this is from Homer's Iliad, um, the story, and this is a very old sculpture, but he's removing the snake from it. And Jonathan talks about how what this strategy does, but it does it, it's doing this in both of the pieces, is it's de-theologizing, stripping away the spe specifics of a particular religious idea, and then possibly allowing us to re-theologize, to think in Laocon's case of not just the human agony of a goddess calling a snake to eat you and your sons because you're prophesying the fall of Troy, but maybe just like torment, you know, if we remove the specific reference to Greek pagan um, religion, do we get at something or, uh, more universal about human suffering? Mm -hmm. If we remove the actual imagery of the Christian imagery of the Ghent altarpiece, do we get at some, some broader idea of isn't this universe sacred in some manner? Mm -hmm. Isn't that sky sacred in some manner? Right. Even if you're not a Christian, don't you still go to European cathedrals and think they're pretty beautiful? Right, yeah. 
You know, it's like, it's, it's again, to me, it's, it's always to say not to replace sacred imagery of any religion, but rather as another option where we as contemporary artists can contend with ideas of sacred art in manners that are not necessarily beholden to the specific religions that they adhere to. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to like mix and match and do weird things and explore. Right. Um, and that's why I think like Martine's work is doing this in a lot of ways and, and it is okay to be offended by it. That's, yeah. that's an appropriate response. Yeah, and uh, not, not just an appropriate response, but sometimes I think a, um, um, an important response. Like we talk a lot, we've talked a few times about um, the, the immersion or piss crisis it's commonly called. Yeah. And the, the idea of being offended by that piece is like, oh, it, it is offensive and it's meant to be offensive. And the, like, but the question is, who, who are you offended at? Like, yeah. why is it offensive to you? Like, like, if you really dig into that, I think you'll start to get at something that is actually meaningful, which is like, well, at the end of the day, the, the crucifixion has a profoundly offensive element to it. And that's something I don't think we, we think about as often as maybe we should as Christians. Like, it's like... Well, let me ask you this. Have you met very many Christians who don't do what they call sin? <laughs> uh, hardly any. Okay. If you held to a belief mm -hmm. that your well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all Christians, regardless of denomination, think something like there was a man in the first century of, uh, who came, he, he was an intermixture. Mm -hmm. Different denominations think different ways about what that mixture means, but right. he's God and man, yep. God's son. He was perfect and didn't sin. And humans crucified him and killed him. And the reason they get offended when it's put in piss is because it's a symbol of their God and the glory of his self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So most Christians would say something along the lines of, it wasn't just the people in the first century who crucified him. Otherwise... They wouldn't be able to say that Christ's crucifixion atones for their own sin. Right. So they would say, my sin crucified Christ. Right. Something along those lines, right? So if they're offended by Andres Serrano putting an image of the crucifixion, not actually, it's not like Jesus came to Serrano's studio and he put Jesus in urine. Yeah. He took an image of that symbol and put it in urine. If that's so offensive... Shouldn't we be way more offended at the fact that we crucified Christ? Right, exactly. It's, um... In which case, so if they actually believe that, if they were justifiably offended by what Serranos did, wouldn't they sin no more? Right. I mean, that, that gets into a much, a much bigger theology question of the... <laughs> It wouldn't. Why? Why don't we just stop sinning? But um, <laughs> you know, exactly, that, that exactly. Trick. But but it is this idea of like. Uh, it's um well we we've, we've talked about this privately a little bit before but it's like this idea that art has to be beautiful like that's a definition that some people like seem to kind of carry with them and the idea of yeah. like making art that is ugly or offensive is is wrong in some way because you're you're disobeying one of these sacred tenets of art which is that it has to be beautiful but it's like well, if you, if you want to be able to talk about things that aren't beautiful like if you actually want to exercise like the human ability to communicate that sometimes things happen that are really, really bad, you're going to have to delve into this world of things that are profane and ugly and not beautiful and understand how to use those things as well. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're going to appropriate the good, you have to know how to appropriate the bad in the same manner. Yeah, and if you're, and if you're gonna say that Christian art, whatever that means, I hate that term, but mm. whatever that means has to be beautiful, well, you better get rid of a lot of the Psalms, um, Habakkuk, uh, Joshua, Kings, King, yeah, <laughs> Kings and Samuel. Um, I, let's just let's just throw out the Old Testament. Um, <laughs> Revelation is pretty ugly. Uh, there's some weird parables that Jesus tells, and he curses a fig tree for some reason. That's not very nice. Um, you so know, like Paul. Paul writes some letters that have some pretty lewd acts described in them. There's some pretty yeah. awful things in there. So yeah, that's it's, um, it's it's an interesting bar to hold for people who are Christians who make art today when there are people who made your liturgy mm -hmm. and they made it crass mm -hmm. and they made it ugly 
and they talked about a woman being raped and tearing her apart and sending her body parts across the nation of Israel in order to get people to act. Right. It's like, so if, if they're allowed to do that, they're allowed to cut up a woman, a victim's body, in order to say, look at how evil these people are, that's justifiable. But an artist saying, look at how bad we are. Mm -hmm. We did this to Christ. It is as if I pissed on him. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, shame on you, artist. No, yeah. you just showed me another reason why I should really be worried about my sin. I, I think that in some ways what this comes down to, and this I don't know if this ties directly into this conversation or not, but I think it speaks to the power of the visual image, like yeah. how visual people are, where it's like the idea of seeing something or like having to encounter something in a physical a physical location or a physical space is instantly um, like it's more aggressive like it, it forces you to confront it yeah and uh, and we don't have that reaction to to literature in any ways because you know if we were to I don't want to I don't want to say too much about banning books because that's a touchy subject right now but like the amount of the amount of super popular books that contain ugliness is is like every classic every classic great work of literature has extreme ugliness in it yeah and we we understand it and but then when we're forced to look at it we're like no that's wrong yeah which mm. this gets at uh what even martin says about his work uh jonathan highlights a quote from martin when um He's saying, look, when you're working in this framework, when you're working as a conceptual artist, when you're noticing all of these new tools and logics and strategies that you can use, one cannot ultimately step out of a religious frame and reference because you cannot avoid the biggest question in life, the meaning of it. So because the conceptual artists have pointed out the fact that the number one thing that is important to art which is my definition of art, mm -hmm. is its meaning, its concept, what it gets at, you ultimately cannot help but start wrestling with religious ideas. Because the, it, what makes an idea religious is if it's ultimate or not. Right. And I think it's, it's interesting because it's like, well, in some ways, in some ways I see them maybe pointing at the same thing where it's like when you ask yourself, the very, the very kind of um, what Carl Jung would say about religion, right, is that it's like the concept of religion is humans kind of grasping with these ideas that are too big for us to to deal with, like yeah. these things that like we just can't understand, and we're like literally wrestling with them, and that's that's what art is doing as well. So it's like it's as though there's no there's no wonder that parallel exists. Like of course, because. Yeah. The, it's the it's the like you just said like it's the same questions we're just kind of coming at them from different sides. Yeah, Jonathan says. In other words, Martin's procedures and representations do not evacuate Christianity, but display its enduring structures. Indeed, what I want to explore here is the possibility that Martin Martin's representation of emptied religious artifacts is precisely what might cause the theological substance of these objects to register anew. It's like, what is an altarpiece trying to show us? Mm -hmm. What is an empty bell without a clapper trying to say about a bell tolling mm -hmm. and your ultimate inevitability of death? We didn't talk about that one, but Jonathan talks about it a lot. Um, it's like this, this, these conceptual works of art, in getting rid of some degree of specificity, they're boiling things down and getting at that more general approach. And they're, in my opinion, revealing, you know, if we had more time, we would read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. But it's like revealing that no matter your answer to this question that, that I reference here, the meaning of life, the meaning of it all, it's like artwork, we, the reason we get offended by weird modern and contemporary art that, that seems almost like a joke, and we think, why are you wasting my time? is because you're making the presupposition that your time can be wasted. Mm -hmm. If your life is meaningless, your time cannot be wasted. And it also can't be used wisely. Mm -hmm. But if it is meaningful, and you go and look at an artwork, what you're ultimately trying to do is find meaning. And the art you like is the work that you see the most meaning in. Mm -hmm. It's like, to, to swing it back to Barry, to wrap up our conversation here of, we like... Like every individual is going to be attracted to the artwork that they see the most meaning in. And sometimes 
something meaningful to them is like the skill that human beings have. You know, I think about especially people who enjoy sports and like like watching Olympians break records. Mm -hmm. It's like because they're fascinated by our ability. Mm -hmm. And when you see, you know, some of the old Chuck Close work where he's doing these photorealistic massive drawings of himself. It's just it is. It's like it's like watching an Olympian. Mm -hmm. Man, you can be this good at drawing. Mm -hmm. You can show like the dimples inside of a pore with graphite. Yeah. Like that's insane. Yeah. And it's like that that is astounding and meaningful. I'm not discounting and saying who are these people who don't see the meaning I see? Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is like, I see a lot of meaning in Piss Christ and a lot of meaning in Chris Martin's work. And I understand not everyone's going to. Mm -hmm. But what I want to highlight is this idea that I think, I think it shows that Barry is right. I think it means I'm right. <laughs> uh, and that is this notion of like the meaning, that we're, we're searching for that. And the reason when we encounter a work of art that we know other people find meaningful and we can't figure it out, it's confronting us with the fact that we're not complete. Right. We, it, like, that's the thing, like you were saying about visual art just now. It's like visual art confronts you. All art does to some degree. But it's like, no, it's a literal thing that we, we look at. Mm -hmm. We're like, what do you mean? And then it's like a banana tape to the wall. And you're <laughs> like, ah, you smug assholes. Right. You know, it's like, that's why. Yeah. It, it, like, it is literally revealing that somehow the universe is religious and that's why we can make artwork. Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty good place to wrap this series up, Greg. Alrighty. Oh, that was good. <laughs>